This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Adam Winkler is a UCLA law professor who has done what I think is a rather remarkable thing. At a time when the debate in this country is red hot over gun rights, he has managed to write a book about gun control and gun laws and gun rights that has drawn rave reviews from both, both opponents and advocates of stricter gun control measures. His book is called Gun Fight, The Battle Over the Right to Bear arms in America. Adam Winkler, welcome to Legally Speaking. Thanks for having me. Um, let me be honest, before I read your book, uh, my sense was that this fight over the right to bear arms was largely a fight that pitted more or less rational people against people who, would, uh, who I would describe as, as gun nuts. Um, but, uh, you know, your book, I think, conveys the sense that the issue is uh, a lot more interesting than that and, and certainly more complicated. And, and it's an issue that's not without its ironies and paradoxes. But, but, but let me begin with what for me is a threshold question, and that is knowing what you know about guns, would you say that klutzy middle-aged men like myself are more safe or less safe with guns in the house? Well, it depends on how klutzy you are, I guess. Uh, very klutzy. Yeah, very, very klutzy. Very, Maybe klutzy. You have very I, I probably shouldn't be driving. Uh, you know, we <laughs> often, hear, part of the story is here, we often hear about how often guns are used to kill people. Mm -hmm. uh, there's about a little less than 15,000 people who die from criminal misuse of guns every year, and about 16 or 17,000 people who kill themselves with firearms. Mm -hmm. Suicide is the most common form of gun fatality. How many um, people die in swimming pools? Yeah, well, there's a, a good number that die uh, in swimming pools. Two, uh, we kind of hope that people are spending more time playing with their swimming pools uh, than having their kids play with their guns. Um, so hopefully that comparison is not the best comparison to make. Um, but we, well, we often hear of how many deaths from guns, uh, about 30,000 a year. What we don't often hear about is how often guns are used defensively for self-defense. And the value of the Second Amendment, according to the Supreme Court, is that it protects an individual's right to have a firearm for personal protection, to self-defense against criminals and whatnot. And while it's very difficult to get comprehensive and reliable data on how often people use guns in self-defense, the numbers range from anywhere from 200,000 to up to 3 million instances a year. Uh, and we don't know exactly which number it is, but especially if it's at that high end, that's an awful lot of times every year that a gun is either just brandished, much less fired and engaged well, in a shootout to may, protect you, someone. Yeah, you mentioned John Lott, an economist who has claimed that he has collected enough data to state with confidence confidence that 98% of people who stop crime uh, never fire a shot. Mm -hmm. They merely brandish their weapon. Uh, there's a lot of controversy about that claim, but still even right. the federal government has estimated that over 100,000 defensive uses of guns occur every year. So does that suggest that there is at least a sliver of truth to the claim that the more guns we have, the better? Well, it's a complicated claim. Um, there is some, John Lott has done some studies that uh, purport to show that in states that have made it easier for people to get concealed carry weapons, so they can carry guns hidden on their persons when they're out in the, st in the streets, uh, that, we're fi that he finds that there are statistically significant reductions in violent crime uh, across the board, really. Um, that, those studies have been very controversial. Many people have picked them apart. Many people have, uh, have pointed out that uh, a lot of his findings were uh, heavily relied 
relying on the state of Florida, and if you take Florida out of the mix, then uh, the, the answers turn out to be much less clear. Um, one thing, though, that even his opponents show is that the laws allowing people to have guns on the street um, more easily in so many states has not led to spikes in crime. Mm -hmm. um, whatever you think of the causal effect, we're, we're living in a time where crime, violent crime is at an all-time low. Uh, the violent crime numbers here in Los Angeles County are less than they were 40 years ago. Not only as a rate, but as an absolute number, even though three million additional people have moved into LA County. So we're at a time where crime is not skyrocketing and having easy access to guns and having as many guns as we have in America doesn't necessarily lead to the spikes in crime that many people on the gun control side have worried about. So I think the answer is complicated. The, the evidence is not crystal clear that it leads to more guns lead to less crime. But I think it is pretty clear that the more guns haven't le hasn't led to more crime. So what would you say to people who argue, and I'm sure people make this argument, that if everyone were allowed to bring a concealed firearm onto an airplane, 9-11 would have never have happened. Right, and you know, um, uh, when after 9-11, uh, no less a uh, political figure uh, uh, than Ron Paul uh, was out there saying that 9-11 happened in part because yeah. of restrictions on Second Amendment rights. And there's a certain can... crazy logic to that, isn't there? Well, there is, you know, there is a certain logic to it. I mean, I think that most of us recognize that if we were criminals, we wouldn't want to attack people who had guns. Uh, and there's, it's widely believed that in the United States, one of the reasons why we have a lot of burglaries, uh, people breaking into your home to steal things when you're not home, as compared to home invasions, people breaking in when you're home, uh, is at least in part because criminals have some measure of rationality and they don't want to break into a home that's got a gun uh, where someone's going to shoot them. So there's some, there is some logic in the fact that, you know, uh, criminals don't want to act where they're likely to get shot. Um, however, you know, we know there's lots of communities where there's lots of guns uh, and there's a lot of people getting shot. Um, so it's not crystal clear to me that uh, having everyone have a gun is really the answer to the problem. Uh, what we found is that, at least in some places, that we can really make them secure and uh, we probably don't need guns on airplanes and having them would probably cause more accidents than uh, lives to be saved. But perhaps prevented 9-11 perhaps prevented 9-11, um, or perhaps not. You know, maybe if you're allowing people to come with guns on the plane, uh, maybe they bring something else to take down the plane, who knows. Uh, mm -hmm. But again, gun policy shouldn't be determined by incidents like 9-11, or frankly, even like incidents uh, like Newtown. That gets us it gets us interested in the issue and it gets it become part of the public focus. But I think gun violence is a public health problem. There's uh, you know 30,000 people a year every year are dying in America from gun violence. The goal should be to figure out what are the best policies we can put in place that are going to that's going to lower that number a little bit every year. Mm -hmm. There's no single right answer that's going to we can snap our fingers, pass an expanded background check law, and and end all gun crime. That's not going to happen. There's 300 million guns or more in America today. Criminals will still be able to. Get get their hands on them, but we can put measures in place that will lower that death toll little by little by little. Uh, and you know, uh, every day if we save one person's life, uh, then in any month you save as many people as died in the Sandy Hook tragedy. By the way, do you own a gun? Uh, well, I don't advertise my gun ownership. You know, if I if I say no, then the robbers will come pick up my house. And, right, right. You know, I don't know about your your clients. Yeah. Uh, I enjoy shooting. Uh, I, I like to to shoot. I, I was not born and raised uh, a shooter. I was uh, born and raised in Southern California. Yeah, you were you weren't exactly raised in the wilderness. I came from you're a, a Hollywood. You're a Hollywood kid. I came from a Hollywood liberal family uh, where we had very the strictest kind of gun control. No, we weren't allowed to have cap guns, water guns. We weren't allowed to make guns with our fingers. No guns uh, whatsoever. You know, uh, I was the the third son uh, uh, of my parents, and both my older brothers went into the entertainment business. Uh, I went to law school, and it's a very odd Jewish family where the kid goes to law school and he's the black sheep. You know, hmm. but that's you know that's the Hollywood family I came from. So, uh, did you leave the world of movies and movie stars to become a legal academic because you thought legal academia was more glamorous? <laughs> Your glamour is all, it's all glamour all the time, indeed. Um, no, you know, I, I, I knew when I was young that I didn't want to be uh, in Hollywood, that I wanted to go sort of uh, take my own path and, uh, and see how that went. Uh, and when I was in law school, I really fell in love with uh, legal academia. I loved scholarship. Uh, and plus, maybe there's a little part of me that said, wait a second, school is the single best place in one's life 
you get summer vacations, mm -hmm. you deal with young people all the time, you're intellectually engaged and stimulated on new topics at all times. Well, why would I want to leave here? So I've been in school ever since. But no movie stars. Yeah, no movie stars. We yeah. don't get too many of them. <laughs> Although UCLA is very, very attractive people here, I've noticed. Right. Yeah. Um, so as an academic, how did you get interested in gun rights? I was working in some other areas, uh, and uh, I was prompted to do some research on the Second Amendment because as a constitutional law scholar, I realized that I had studied a lot about the First Amendment and the Fourth Amendment, right against unreasonable searches and seizures, and the Fourteenth Amendment's equal protection and due process clauses, and I never really thought much about the Second Amendment. And if I had thought about it, I kind of approached it the way someone who grew up in my background would approach it. Oh, that's a dead letter. That doesn't mean anything today. Mm -hmm. um, but there was enough scholarship over the last 20 years in constitutional law fields that uh, as I came upon it, I started to realize that I should look and make my own judgment and look into the historical sources. Mm -hmm. And what I found when I looked into America's history into guns and gun control was just fascinating. It was far more rich and complex than I had ever imagined. And among the things that I became convinced is that uh, the best reading of the Second Amendment is to protect an individual's right to have guns. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, let, let's go back to a point you made about defensive use of, of firearms. Uh, do you, I mean, we've heard about all the horrible incidents, Columbine, Virginia mm. Tech, Aurora, uh, Newtown, uh, but we, we don't hear that much in the media about uh, you know, pl uh, incidents like the one that happened at Pearl Harbor High School in Mississippi where a vice principal uh, stopped a kid uh, by brandishing a gun and uh, who was uh, had just killed the kid had just killed his mom and a couple of mm -hmm. other kids and was on his way to the high school at least that was the fear I mean do you think that the media has uh, uh, given us a skewed view of uh, of, of this con of the of, of guns and mm -hmm. the, the, the the role they play in society you know probably I don't think that there's some grand media conspiracy to give us a skewed view but there are just various structural features of uh, the world of the media that uh, affect this issue. So there's an old story, if it bleeds, it leads. Mm -hmm. Like that's how the nightly news works. So mm -hmm. you're gonna cover the story of people getting killed. What you're not covering is the story of, you know, someone who was in their home last night, heard rustling outside, peered out their window, saw a guy about to break in, goes, brandish, gets his shotgun, goes chuck, chuck, mm -hmm. and the bad guy says, wait, I'm getting out of here, and runs away. Mm -hmm. That's never gonna make the news, not because there's a media bias against guns, there may or may not be such a thing, but that's not why that's gonna make the, not gonna make the news, it's not gonna make the news because it's not really newsworthy. Mm -hmm. uh, when someone defends themselves with a firearm, if they're not actually firing it and, and shooting. So, uh, there is that. What I do think is that to the extent there's some media bias, I think there's a lot of people in the media who don't know a lot about guns, and guns can be more complicated than you think. And so you often hear, for instance, assault weapons being portrayed as automatic weapons. So I've seen plenty of news reports when they're talking about, should we ban assault weapons? And they'll show a video clip of a machine gun. Assault weapons are not machine guns. They're mm -hmm. two different kinds of weapons. Uh, machine guns are already heavily regulated. You can't sell new machine guns in America today. Uh, so you do find that kind of lack of awareness uh, yeah. and lack of knowledge. Again, I'm not sure it's bias as much as just people not having any knowledge well, it about also firearms. Seemed, yeah, it also seems that legislators don't have a lot of knowledge about firearms. Uh, you've criticized the assault weapons ban mm -hmm. because it focused more on how the weapons look than rather than how they operate. I mean, is that a fundamental problem that the people who are legislating as right. well as uh, reporting on, on these weapons don't know what they're talking about? I think it's a major problem because it gives makes it a lot easier for the gun rights people to defeat their arguments when uh, people are making arguments that are not well founded in fact and in how guns work. I mean the assault weapons ban I think is a good example. When I first began writing Gunfight, uh, if you had asked me what I thought about assault weapons, I was like we should get rid of those weapons. There's no reason to those laws. Those, you hear it all the time. But there's no reason why anyone should have a military style firearm. But when you actually look at the law and how it works you start to think well it's not really all that clear cut. Uh, what counts as an assault rifle because there's no set definition of assault rifle is a certain kind of rifle that has various military style characteristics like a mm -hmm. pistol grip or a flash suppressor. When the old assault weapons ban was in effect from 94 to 2004, the manufacturers said, okay, we'll make the exact same gun, just as lethal, mm -hmm. but without the pistol grip. 
or without the flash suppressor. Mm -hmm. And they sold millions of those guns. And you haven't made the world safer by getting rid of pistol grips. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, the assault weapons ban uh, is really one of those laws that if you don't know much about guns, you think, we got to get rid of those guns. If you understand guns, you understand how this law works and that it's got it's so riddled with loopholes and that basically the manufacturer, manufacturers can make the exact same guns without mm -hmm. these pistol grip or a uh, flash suppressor, yeah. and all of a sudden you can sell them. And so you realize as you know, learn more about guns, at yeah. least I've found, as I learn more about guns, you have a much more nuanced understanding about what it's going to take to regulate them effectively. There was a, Governor Cuomo recently had to backtrack in New York. He was regulating against a magazine clip that didn't exist. Uh, did you read about that? I mean, again, is that a, another example of legislators, gov executives not knowing what they're doing? So we have an example. So right after Newtown, New York passed a whole comprehensive new set of restrictive gun laws. And even though uh, the federal government wasn't able to get anything passed uh, in the first round of proposals on expanded background checks uh, in, in March, April, sorry, um, we saw um, uh, state level reforms being enacted in New York, Colorado, Connecticut. California is going to adopt some reforms, and that's where the gun control movement really is uh, active. And one of New York's restrictions was to ban the, uh, the sale or possession of any um, high capacity magazine defined as any magazine that could hold seven rounds or seven more. Seven rounds, right. And it turns out that they there just aren't one. magazines that hold less than seven <laughs> rounds. So, uh, again. It's, I think it's in the smallest 10. Yeah, and so yeah. it just doesn't make sense to yeah. have, have this. Uh, it was like, hey, we want to limit the number of rounds someone can fire, but you're requiring everyone to give up their magazines, and there's no magazines you can put in the gun, you no longer have functional firearms. So, that was, so yeah. they're backtracking that law. It's a little embarrassing, right? It is. I think it is embarrassing. Yeah. And, and frankly, what I found is, is that people in the gun community who know guns well, they feel this is just how it's happening time and time again. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the reasons why they're so mistrustful mm -hmm. of gun control laws, why they oppose quote unquote common sense gun laws, is because they say, look, when you look at how these things really work, uh, they really impose hassles on gun owners and don't really accomplish much. And mm -hmm. when they see law after law that puts hassles on gun owners but doesn't really accomplish much, and they start to lose faith in the regulatory process. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about the Second Amendment. It invariably comes up when people argue about guns, although that wasn't always the case, right? right? That's a, a relatively recent phenomenon. Uh, but but the, the amendment reads, quote, a well-regulated militia, comma, being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, comma, shall not be infringed. Uh, now, you, you've been asked before what those 27 words mean, and you've already indicated that you feel they mean that, uh, uh, that, they're, that, that it, they guarantee an individual's right to have guns for personal protection. And, and I have to say I'm a little puzzled by, by that position sure. because no matter how many times I read those 27 words, I don't see anything about personal safety or personal use. Uh, and, and even if I believe that the Second Amendment guarantees an individual right, I, I don't think that means you can just ignore the first 13 words of that amendment, uh, the part about the well-regulated militia. Right. And, and what those words tell me is that this right is being asserted not to advance a self-interest, but a collective interest. Yeah. That's how I read it. What, what am I missing? Right. What the Supreme Court said in the 2008 case it didn't ignore those first 13 words. It said that, well, what did the framers mean by a well-regulated militia? And there is good evidence that the founding fathers thought that the militia was made up of common citizens who would go home and grab their guns and be ready to fight in an instant. Hence, the Minutemen from revolutionary fame. Uh, we know that uh, the founding fathers did not believe in a standing army. And so they right. thought that national defense would be served by having state-level militias. And those state-level militias would not be like the National Guard today, uh, but ordinary common citizens who would be called out to serve and bring their guns uh, into service. Uh, and uh, so the Supreme Court said that the Militia Clause is not contrary to the idea that there's an individual right to bear arms because it was grant to all the people. And then the, the, an important point is, is that uh, the language, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, we have that same language in the First Amendment, the right of the people peaceably to assemble. We have the same language in the Fourth Amendment, uh, the right of the people to be secure uh, in their persons, houses, effects, papers, not in that order, from unreasonable searches and seizures. Mm -hmm. We interpret that language in, the, in every other constitutional provision to mean an individual's right. 
right to do something. It would be somewhat odd to interpret the Second Amendment to use the similar language to grant a right to a state or to a state collectivity when every other right is an individual right and even ones that are adopted at the exact same time using very similar language. So those are some of the arguments that the Supreme Court made. It obviously doesn't solve all the problems and one of the things I emphasize in my book uh, is that even if you're not sure about the original meaning of the Second Amendment, because I'm not personally an originalist, I believe history matters but I'm not uh, wedded to uh, originalism, is that if you think about our constitutional tradition, there's a long tradition of Americans interpreting the Second Amendment to provide an individual right to bear arms. And I think that that long history and tradition has value in constitutional interpretation. Yeah, I'm willing to accept that it's an individual right, but what I don't see is how it's about personal safety. Mm, right, right, right. Where do you get that? Well, the, what the Supreme Court said was that the core of the Second Amendment is the right to have a firearm for self-defense. And, and they define self-defense. And I don't get it. That's okay. I mean, the question <laughs> is, why do you have uh, well, what, firearms? Yeah. You know, when you think about it, we have the First Amendment right of freedom of speech. And uh, what we generally don't say is, well, I see that there's a freedom of speech, but I don't see a reason for the freedom of speech. So as a result, you can stop art artists from speaking because the founding fathers weren't clearly protecting artistic speech. Generally, that's what our constitutional rights, they provide a broad principle, uh, a broad protection for certain kinds of activity, and it's up to the courts to give some but, meaning to that but the second in amendment, particular application. The Second Amendment is the only amendment where a, a specific purpose is stated, correct? And the Supreme Court said that that was, the, and the primary purpose of the Second Amendment was to protect these state-level militias so mm -hmm. that people could have these guns and mm -hmm. serve in the state-level militias. The way they protected that right, the court said, was by guaranteeing individuals the right to keep and bear arms. Uh, and that, that the founding fathers knew that the way that militias were disarmed or, the, or rendered ineffective was through disarmament of the people. Let, let me read to you what Saul Cornell writes in a paper that he wrote with uh, Nathan Danino. Saul Cornell is a uh, historian, has made something of a specialty of the Second Amendment, and, and he writes, although gun rights advocates have become somewhat obsessed obsessed with proving that the right to bear arms includes private arms for private purposes, there is little in the history, the text, or the structure of the Constitution to support such a view. Only by constructing an alternative history fantasy in which the Second Amendment was authored by Daniel Shays, Samuel Adams, or the dissenting anti-federalist minority of Pennsylvania can such a view be sustained. Is, is he totally wrong? He's not totally wrong, and I think Saul Cornell is uh, an excellent scholar who does very interesting work in this area. Um, he's got a way with words, uh, Saul, that's to be sure. But even, <laughs> even Saul's own work, though, he, he argues that uh, the idea that the framers intended to protect the right of individuals to have guns for personal protection, uh, he argues that was not the original uh, fr uh, meaning of uh, the Second Amendment, and he's very clear about that. Right. But he also argued in his work that by 1820 or 1830, the American people had, had radically reinterpreted the Second Amendment. And and we had state courts, uh, and he talks about these cases extensively, uh, uh, protecting individuals' right to have guns for personal protection. And you know, we talk a lot about the Second Amendment, but we should also remember that 43 of 50 states have constitutional provisions protecting the right of individuals to have guns. And there's no question that those protect the right of individuals to have guns for personal protection, and we have court cases going back to right. literally the 1820s saying that those protections are for individual rights. But but I guess uh, the, the question that I want to ask you is, you know, if there are those who argue that, you know, on originalist grounds, when you look at what James Madison meant and what other founding fathers meant, they wanted uh, to guarantee an individual right for personal protection. And, and that begs the question, well, if that's what they meant, why didn't they say it more clearly? Why didn't they say it as clearly as it was stated in the Vermont State Constitution of 1777 or the Pennsylvania State Constitution of 1776 and, or 1790? Uh, let me just read to you. The, uh, the Pennsylvania State Constitution uh, stated uh, before the Second Amendment was written, the right of the citizens to uh, bear arms in defense of themselves and the state shall not be questioned. Uh, in Vermont, Vermont in 1777, it said, quote, the people have a right to bear arms for the defense of themselves and the state. You know, Madison and his brethren 
could have used that language. They didn't. Is Are you saying that that wasn't a conscious decision on their part? I'm not sure that it was a conscious decision uh, or not. There's no nothing in the, in the congressional record or the record of the Constitutional Convention that shows that they considered the language for defense of themselves. Um, you might take those provisions as evidence of how people thought of what the right to bear arms was, a right to protect yourself and a right to protect the state. Right. That was the self-defense writ large that right. the Supreme Court... But I mean, should it be a constitutional, a fundamental uh, right, or should it be just a matter of common law? I mean, that was what the Founding Fathers had to decide, right? And there's disagreements about that. And again, um, so many of your questions focus on originalism. Mm -hmm. I don't think that you need to be an originalist to believe that the Second Amendment protects the right of individuals to have guns. For personal use. For personal use, because that's the way I think the Second Amendment has been interpreted by we the people time and time again. Mm -hmm. And if you believe in a constitution that evolves to keep up with changes in society, um, you have to be willing to recognize sometimes that it might evolve in ways that support your political opponents rather mm -hmm. than your own personal, uh, one's own political, personal politics. Mm -hmm. and, and I think any objective measure of uh, a living constitution hard to conclude that the Second Amendment doesn't protect an individual right. One mm -hmm. of the interesting things is it seems pretty clear from historians that the 14th Amendment was adopted to the Constitution after the Civil War right. in part to protect the right of freedmen to have guns for personal protection. So it's an interesting kind of way of thinking about it. Even if you're not sure what the Second Amendment was intended to mean originally, we know that when the 14th Amendment was added to the Constitution, the framers of the 14th Amendment thought that they were protecting the right of freedmen to exercise their Second Amendment rights. They said it over and over again. Mm -hmm. And that Second Amendment right was a right to have a gun for personal protection against white racists. Mm -hmm. So we have other provisions of the Constitution that were based on an assumption of what the Second Amendment uh, was meant to uh, meant to uh, mean. But one of the things I think that's sort of left out of our discussion so far is that I think it's important to recognize that whatever your sense of the proper understanding of the Second Amendment, um, it does protect the individual right to have guns under our current law, under the Supreme Court's precedence. And the Supreme Court's also made crystal clear that there's plenty of room for gun control under the Second Amendment. And the existence, and one of the reasons I wrote this book, is to defeat the idea that just because you have a right to bear arms doesn't mean uh, that you can't have gun control. Uh, and uh, we can have both. And the Founding Fathers had restrictive gun laws that today's NRA members would never accept. Uh, and the story of guns in America is a story of balancing gun rights with public safety. Uh, and my view is that we can have them both. Mm -hmm. Under the Second Amendment, do I have the right to mount an insurrection against the federal government if I feel that the government uh, has uh, succumbed to the temptations of power and has become tyrannical? I don't believe so. Uh, there, isn't there, that what the Founding Fathers meant? I don't believe that to be the case. I think it mu fundamentally misunderstands the nature of a Constitution to even promote that idea. The Constitution was not designed to give people the means to tear up the Constitution. But then that's what Sanford Levinson is saying at the uh, University of Texas. Akhil Amar at Yale says that that's true. Uh, David Williams at the University of Indiana. Isn't there a consensus even within legal academia today that that was a core motivation? I'm not sure that there is. Uh, I think that you have to recognize two things that make that very difficult argument to sustain. Uh, one, the first part of the Second Amendment that we've talked about already, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. Well, who did the regulating? Well, mm -hmm. it was it was lawmakers did the regulating. And it wasn't just state lawmakers. Another provision of the Constitution provides that Congress shall have the power to organize, arm, and discipline the militias. Well, if you can organize, arm, and discipline the militias, um, presumably uh, the federal government government has authority to uh, exercise some modicum of control over those militias. Mm -hmm. so, to, so to assume that what the founders were doing was trying to create sort of some sphere of state autonomy or autonomy of individuals mm -hmm. to fight against a tyrannical government, fundamentally, only you can only come up with that solution if you ignore language in the Constitution that gives lawmakers the right to regulate the militia. Yeah. So no, I think it fundamentally misunderstands the nature of a Constitution. Uh, the Constitution is to create the government, I, I, not to create its downfall. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the Constitution is giving mixed signals here because on the one hand, certainly the Founding Fathers had a sincere fear of tyranny. After all, they True. they fought a revolution, they viewed King George as a tyrant, uh, they were concerned about standing arm armies, they were concerned about a federal government getting too powerful. On the other hand, they also had a fear of anarchy, 
right? And, and, and so how do you reconcile that concern about tyranny mm -hmm. and that willingness to arm the citizens with other parts of the Constitution that in essence criminalize treason mm -hmm. and empower the Congress to suppress insurrections? How do you square that circle? Well, I think it's not so difficult as long as you don't interpret the Second Amendment to be a right to engage in insurrection against the government. Uh -huh. um, and I think maybe that's part of the reason why the Supreme Court and courts uh, throughout American history have emphasized uh, that the Second Amendment is a right to have a firearm for self-defense, uh, maybe writ small, uh, in terms of being able to protect yourself. And I think it is very much in line with our constitutional values in this way, uh, that while guns are an unusual item and that they kill, um, the idea of our Bill of Rights is to protect us and to protect our liberties. And um, I think when a criminal comes into your home and tries to take your life or take your dignity, um, your that firearm provides you with a means to protect your fundamental liberties. Uh, and. Also, one of the things I think we should mention here, too, is that, you know, to the extent we think that the Second Amendment was about fighting tyranny, we should remember that Congress in the 1790s passed the Militia Acts requiring uh, uh, people to uh, show up at mandatory musters mm -hmm. uh, with their guns in tow, ordered them to, or, or, to have certain kinds of guns. Um, we had extensive regulation of militia members in the yeah. founding era. This was not just uh, ordinary people who didn't have any, uh, were acting totally without the constraints of law. They were operating within the constraints of law in ways that were quite burdensome. Yeah, I mean, Thomas Jefferson, though, famously said that the tree of liberty needs to be refreshed every so often with the blood of tyrants and patriots. Certainly, he believed that there was a right to rebel against the federal government, didn't he? I think that all of our founders believed that there was a right to rebel against tyrannical government. I don't think they necessarily thought there was a right to revolt against the federal government. There was a right to revolt against tyrannical government. And remember, when the Founding Fathers revolted, they created uh, political institutions, representative institutions, mm -hmm. to determine and make that decision. It was not a bunch of individuals who met in an outhouse in the backwoods of Virginia and decided we were going to have a revolution. Yeah. Right? They sent delegations from all the different colonies to come together and to decide what to do. Uh, and uh, if we, the states, decide to come together and, and form a rebellion against the government, yeah. I don't think that's a Second Amendment issue. It's a broader constitutional question, but it's not a Second Amendment issue. Yeah. I don't think that uh, the way to understand the Civil War is as the southern states' uh, residents exercising their Second Amendment right to revolt against a tyrannical government. Mm -hmm. You know, it occurs to me that most people, many people, uh, ascribe godlike infallibility to the Founding Fathers. Uh, but, and no doubt that they were smart guys, right? But, but when the Founding Fathers stipulated, as they did in the Second Amendment, in the Second Amendment that a well-regulated militia is necessary for the security of a free state, you know, isn't it clear that they were wrong? I mean, hasn't our history in no uncertain terms mm. shown that they were wrong? Fundamentally, yes, right? We don't have that citizens militia anymore right. that the Founding Fathers imagined. The Founding Fathers were very skeptical of a standing army. They thought a standing army would be used corruptly by the government mm -hmm. in the same way that uh, George III had used his army to uh, wreak his t tyranny against uh, the colonists, and uh, previous English kings had done the same in England. Uh, and so they were concerned about that. Uh, they didn't want to have a standing army. Um, what we found in the War of 1812 is that you needed a standing army. In the right. War of they, 1812... They, the performed terribly, the right? The militia performed terribly. States like Massachusetts just refused to send their militia. Mm -hmm. And the British uh, came close to taking back the United States, take, taking back uh, and making us colonies again. They burned Washington, D.C. to the ground. And were it not for the fact that in 1812, uh, England had something else to worry about, a little guy in uh, France known as Napoleon, right. uh, that we probably would be have returned to English citizens in the War of 1812 had we relied on the militia. Right, right. But we still have those 13 words uh, and, and so you know I think to me this sort of underscores the pitfalls of being stuck with an antique constitution mm. you know we have this right and it's linked to a justification clause that really bears no relationship to the world that we live in today right. it's kind of like sitting there in the Constitution like a rotting corpse right. 
and 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 for me to believe that the amendment has a as a whole still has relevance it seems to me what people are asking me to do is to kind of hold my nose and make believe that smell i'm smelling from the rotting corpse is of no consequence uh, do you think I'm mischaracterizing what's going on here? Again, the premise of your question is originalism. And mm -hmm. if you reject originalism, it becomes a lot less difficult. In the 20th century, uh, it's my understanding that the United States Supreme Court only interpreted the meaning of the Second Amendment once. Mm. That was U.S. versus Miller in 1939. And, and, and as, as I understand it, what they determined was that uh, weapons that do not have military use do not get constitutional protection and in that case specifically it was a sawed-off machine gun which was much more closely associated with gang behavior than it was with military right. uh, use so what was the imp what was the uh, effect of that decision Miller was a strange decision um, so the reason Miller came about originally because in 1934 Congress passed the very first major federal gun control laws, the National Firearms Act of 1934. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was a law that targeted gangster weapons. It uh, imposed a special tax and registration requirement on machine guns and on sawed-off shotguns, other guns that had been popular in the Prohibition era among gangsters like Al Capone and Bonnie and Clyde. Mm -hmm. uh, and ironically, back in the day, the NRA supported this law and supported the enactment of the National Firearms Act and these restrictions. And Miller was a test case, trying to see whether these laws survived constitutional standards. Um, remember, uh, if you remember from your history class or your constitutional law class, in the 1930s, the court was very activist in restricting federal leg legislation, struck down a lot of mm -hmm. Roosevelt's New Deal policies, for instance. So, so this was a test case to see what the Supreme Court would say. And the Supreme, when the case went to the Supreme Court, uh, the uh, the two men, uh, including Miller, who had been caught with their uh, with a sawed-off shotgun that was not registered, um, they didn't. Uh, their lawyer refused to appear in the Supreme Court. And so it only had the benefit of one side's argument, the administration's. And the administration's argument was that you can't protect this weapon because it's not a military weapon. What was so odd about the reasoning, uh, the reasoning of that case has always very confused people who studied it closely, in part because it's odd to say that a machine gun would have no place in a milit as a military weapon. It seems to be the quintessential military weapon mm -hmm. from our perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's an odd ruling to say that government could restrict these guns because they don't have any military association. And when the Supreme Court decided the Heller case, the next major time the yeah. Supreme Court stepped into this breach, um, the court basically ignored the United States against Miller I mean, what, and said it wasn't really uh, good enough precedent for them to rely I on. I mean, well, to me what's bizarre about Miller is uh, under that logic, it seems to me I should have uh, uh, easier access to an AK-47 than I would to a hunting rifle. Exactly. It's it, kind it, of that an seems odd, right. rather peculiar. But off of Miller, didn't most federal courts then decide that uh, the, the right to bear arms was a collective right, not an individual, yeah, individual right? Yeah, we saw right? a wave of decisions by the federal circuit courts mm -hmm. uh, saying that, well, the Supreme Court has said that it's not an individual right. You can go back and read Miller back and forth and put it on your turntable and listen to it backwards like <laughs> an old Led Zeppelin album or something. And you, what you won't find, unfortunately, is any language about saying whether it's an individual right or not. And there's some ambiguous language that the courts read, um, but I think that was keeping with the tenor of the times. I think that, you know, between 1940, roughly, and, uh, and 1970, uh, there was a big push to right. try to invigorate the gun control movement, uh, to uh, move against having a wide uh, distribution of firearms in civilian hands. Uh, and that view of the Second Amendment that was adopted by some of those federal courts, I think maybe a reflection of that larger trend. And, and move towards yeah. uh, more gun control. Yeah. So from Miller, you got you, you flash forward what 69 years later to Heller, and 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 in in that uh, case, uh, um, which Scalia wrote the majority opinion. And he said, and he basically found an individual right. He said that the personal protection was at the core of that amendment. Again, I'm not sure how he came to that on originalist grounds, certainly, but that's what he said. And uh, of course, the claim that he came to this uh, through originalism has been uh, um, subjected to a lot of skepticism, let us say. And, but what I find interesting is that some of the harshest criticism has come from other conservatives. Mm. Uh, I know Richard. 
Richard Posner, for example, of the Seventh Circuit wrote, quote, Heller's finding is not evidence of disinterested historical inquiry, but rather evidence of the ability of well-staffed courts to produce snow jobs. Uh, Nelson Lund, a, a member in good standing of the Conservative Heritage Foundation, writes, Scalia's Heller opinion will become exhibit A when people seek to discredit originalism. Do you, do you agree with those comments? I do, and uh, I, I make the point, too, in my book, Unfight, that uh, mm -hmm. while this decision was often hailed as a triumph of originalism, uh, in fact, it's really not. Uh, and uh, most of uh, the comments of, of Dick Posner were talking about what is the substance of the right as an individual writer, a collective right of states, uh, and he thought it was the collective right of states is the better uh, better argument there. Um, Nelson Lund and I were sort of arguing on a slightly different perspective. Yeah. Uh, the perspective we took was that, you know, uh, in the Heller case, the court says that uh, the reason why handguns are protected is because they're the most common firearm used for self-defense. Um, and the reason why something like a machine gun is not protected is because they're dangerous and unusual weapons that aren't usually used for self-defense. Well, why are machine guns not used in self-defense? Well, part of it may be because machine guns are just too deadly and no one wants to use them. But another part of it is because there were a sp quite a spread of machine guns in the early days when they first came out. Um, but you've had federal regulation that's made it extremely difficult to get your hands on a machine gun. So uh, if federal regulation of the 20th century, which mm -hmm. has dictated that machine guns be marginalized, if that regulation is going to define the scope of a right, then mm -hmm. it's not originalism, it's living constitutionalism. It's current values and current laws shaping our uh, fundamental rights. Uh, and so I think a lot of, uh, uh, that's an example of uh, one of a number of exceptions that we find in the Heller case where the court says certain kinds of gun control laws are constitutionally permissible, but none of those pre None of those exceptions are especially well grounded in the original history of the Second Amendment. As flawed as the Heller decision may be, uh, you've said that it actually may be a good th thing for the country. And, and let me read a quote uh, from you. You said, uh, quote, Heller offers the opportunity to restore some measure of sanity to the gun debate, thanks in no small part to the contradictions of the decision. What do you mean by that? Mm. Well, uh, I do think so. Well, for one, uh, one contradiction, this originalist opinion that says there's actually a lot of room for reasonable gun control laws, I think was an important concession that the court made. Um, many people in the gun world wanted the court to strike down virtually all gun control laws, except maybe some basic laws uh, against felons having guns. Um, and even that was questioned in some parts of the, of the gun world. But I think the court, by recognizing there was a broad leeway for government to regulate guns, uh, provided uh, much more stability than would have happened had the court taken a radical approach to this issue and said everyone can have guns anywhere they wanted. Mm -hmm. You would have seen a backlash against such a ruling. One thing that's not in the opinion is a, uh, a, a recommended standard of review. Should it be strict scrutiny? Should it be rational basis? Should mm -hmm. it be somewhere in between? Uh, how problematic is that omission? Well, it was really surprising that the court didn't offer a clear standard of review or test. The court had to know that there was going to be hundreds of challenges to every different kind of gun control law yeah. that's on the books. There's a lot of different <coughs> kinds of gun laws, and um, we've seen now lawsuits to almost all of them in the wake of Heller. And the Supreme Court, I think, really did the lower courts a disservice by not saying, hey, here's the test you should apply mm -hmm. in these cases. What we have seen, though, is that the federal circuit courts have coalesced more or less uniformly around uh, an intermediate scrutiny standard of review, mm -hmm. one that recognizes that uh, this is a right, a right that we have to take seriously, um, but still provides that so long as government has an important reason for uh, enacting legislation, important reason being public safety or reduction of crime, yeah. uh, that any law that's substantially related to achieving that goal will be upheld. And indeed, since Heller has decided, there's been approximately 400, maybe more than 400 federal court decisions on the constitutionality of a wide variety of gun control laws, all but a small fraction action of those laws have been upheld. Yeah, but as you've indicated in your book, the evidence in support of uh, the claim that any of these laws, whether it's background checks, uh, assault weapons bans, concealed firearms, the evidence in support of uh, any of these laws having an impact on crime is weak to non-existent. So under any standard of review, if you don't have good evidence to support the effectiveness of these laws, do these laws pass muster? 
Well, what we've seen is that the courts are consistently upholding gun control laws, and it's actually one of the reasons why I really got interested in this area of law. What I found so fascinating about it was because when I did my research, going back uh, throughout American history, we have uh, hundreds of state court cases interpreting the state right to bear arms provisions, um, and the uniform trend there is that uh, very few laws get struck down. Uh, that even right. though state courts but say it's... But should they be struck down? I mean, is it... Ra let's take rational basis. How rational is it to pass a law to limit a fundamental right and people, folks, you know, on the, on the, on the gun, uh, you know, the pro-gun side view it as a fundamental right. Mm -hmm. Uh, a, 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 how rational is it to limit that right when the legislation that you're uh, that, that, that you're passing shows no evidence of being effective. Mm. Well, part of the story is that the Supreme Court generally, when allowing the regulation of rights, doesn't require actually record evidence in to prove that the underlying uh, law fits this uh, uh, this objective. They're willing to take a what you might call a common sense approach to some of these issues. Uh, and I think that's why the court has been willing to, or the courts generally have been willing to uphold so many gun control laws. Mm -hmm. And what they've generally said is that there's evidence in the record to support it. Is that you there? have, well, you, what you have is you often have testimony of police officers or other researchers saying that you can find some moderate effect. Mm -hmm. And indeed, it's not that no gun control law can ever show any kind of effect. I think it's uh, the comp it's just a little bit more complicated than that, yeah. a little more nuanced. And the yeah. nuance is that any law you put into effect comes into a world in which there are already over 300 million guns, where it, criminals have very easy avenues to getting their guns. There are well-established um, pathways for illegal guns to travel across state lines and whatnot, and that any new law is not going to have a huge effect on gun crime. Again, if you approach it like a public health problem, which is yeah. what I think it is, you're about lowering it one bit at a time, and that you don't necessarily need to have uh, a a ton of evidence uh, to show um, uh, that need? a particular law is going to be effective yeah. to recognize that uh, it has the possibility to be effective and we're going to allow government the chance to prove that it is. We've had a war on alcohol that was called prohibition. We've had a war on drugs. We've had a war on pornography. Uh, none of those, we've had a war on prostitution. None of those wars have uh, been terribly effective. So given that history, uh, how much can we reasonably expect from uh, you know, uh, these laws to restrict the access to guns. I think it's actually very difficult for these laws to have any kind of major impact. I think they can have an effect on the margins, but they can't. It's very hard to have a major impact. You know, the truth is, I think prohibition is a good example, and the war on drugs is another good example of yeah, trying to ban small, easy to conceal things that people feel passionately about is just a very difficult thing for the government to do successfully. And mm -hmm. it hasn't worked in either of those other two historical cases. I think if we tried to ban guns, it would be similarly ineffective and only promote more black market in guns, because a lot of people are not going to give up their guns. Right. right. You know, uh, Some people, it's rural. They're rural people who believe in guns, and guns are part of their culture. Other part of people are urban. And mm -hmm. if you think it's hard to get the gun out of a rural person who got their gun from a hunting trip when he was 12 with his dad, mm -hmm. that's a tough gun to get. But try to take the gun away from someone who lives in a bad neighborhood in a city who thinks they need that gun to survive the night. You're never going to get rid of that gun. And uh, I think we shouldn't be focused on that. And I think that as long as the gun debate is a question of whether we should have guns or not have guns, we're going to keep spinning out of control and, and not get the kinds of gun laws that gun control advocates think might make a, a difference. If there's something that's going to make a difference, uh, nothing's going to happen until gun owners are convinced that it's not a first step to taking away their gun rights. Yeah. You've written at some length about the National Rifle Association, and uh, back 40 or 50 years ago, it wasn't nearly as hard, hard line as it is today. Uh, back in the 20s and 30s, I think that they supported background checks and waiting periods. But when you talk about today's NRA, one of the fascinating things that you uh, uh, observed was that the rhetoric that's coming from people like Wayne LaPierre bears a striking resemblance to the rhetoric, rhetoric we heard uh, fr from the Black Panthers in the 1960s. Ta talk a little bit about that. Well, you know, the NRA was not always the no compromises opponent of gun control that we know today. In the mm -hmm. 1920s and 30s, as you mentioned, the NRA was supporting gun control. And when the president of the NRA was asked to testify before Congress on the National Firearms Act of 1934, he said that he didn't think that the Second Amendment had any, imposed any restriction 
in on what the federal government did with regards to gun control laws. And the NRA promoted in state after state restrictive concealed carry laws, laws that today's NRA files lawsuits to declare unconstitutional as a violation of the Second Amendment. So the NRA has shifted radically, and much of that shift came about in the 1970s, where a group of hardliners took over the NRA literally overnight. They staged a coup at the annual membership meeting. And one of the things I point out in my book is I show that much of uh, the impetus for the radicalization of the NRA and the modern gun rights movement really began with the Black Panthers, um, that the Black Panthers, uh, when they were taking up arms and, and invading the, Sacramento, the California state capitol in Sacramento with their loaded pistols, rifles, and shotguns, it led a lot of people to be scared, and it led to a whole new wave of gun control laws to try to restrict uh, people having access to guns, in particular, frankly, um, racial minorities who were very radical and who were, imbo who were embodied by that Malcolm X photo of him staring out the window with the rifle saying, mm -hmm. by any means necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, Americans didn't want by any means necessary because they knew that meant guns. Um, and it was those same laws adopted in the 1960s uh, that really inspired the NRA to become radicalized because there's a lot of white people who thought the government was coming to get their guns next. Uh, and uh, they organized, and uh, today's NRA, we actually find a lot of the same rhetoric that the yeah. Black Panthers was using, that guns are about protecting yourself against tyrannical government that was hostile to your rights, that you had a right to have a gun anywhere and everywhere, that a gun wasn't just a gun to have at home home, but a gun to take in the street, mm -hmm. that the purpose of a gun is not hunting, but protection against government tyranny. Yeah. And here I see a lot of irony as well, because, uh, I mean, I think you, you also point this out, that uh, uh, blacks were targeted for disarmament back in the 19th century. Gun control was, did have a racist tinge to it. And, 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 and so the question is raised, well, does that history give the NRA some legitimate claim to describing itself as a civil rights organization. Do you, do you think so? Well, I think they think of themselves as a civil rights organization, not because they're protecting the rights of racial minorities, but because they think the right to have a gun is a civil right. And uh -huh. so that's their civil right that they're protecting. But no, I, I think you know, you're absolutely right that it's important to recognize that there is a long history of racist gun control laws in America. Um, uh, race has infected so much of the law in America, and especially Especially with regards to the law relating to weapons. The Founding Fathers had racially discriminatory gun laws. Um, in, in the South, before the Civil War, blacks were never allowed to have guns. Uh, and one of the reasons for the formation of the KKK was mm -hmm. that blacks in the, during the Civil War got their hands on guns for the first time. And the KKK, these posses that would go out at night to terrorize black homes, one of their main objectives was to disarm the freedmen who had armed up during the Civil War. Was the KKK a well-regulated militia? Well, you know, honestly, the in <laughs> many states, they thought of the KKK yeah. in those terms. And, and it, after the militias became relatively ineffective as a national defense fighting force um, a, after the War of 1812, in the South, um, militias were repurposed into slave patrols. Yeah. Uh, and those well, militias were serving to keep slaves in line, to catch yeah. fugitive, fugitive slaves. and. Well, there's a, one academic, I believe his name is uh, Carl Bogus, who mm -hmm. argues that the whole idea behind the Second Amendment was racist. It was these from day one, everyone knew these militias weren't going to be any good to, uh, you know, mm -hmm. fight tyranny, but they were pretty good at finding slaves, and that that was the real uh, uh, motivation there. I mean, he's, I think he's kind of a lone voice in this argument, but right. it's an interesting one, right? And I, I, I think that he's absolutely right that that was part of the understanding of at least some people who helped draft and ratify the Constitution was that these militias would be useful as slave patrols as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't think that's the primary motive uh, behind the Second Amendment, um, but it is part of our uncomfortable history of race and racism and gun control laws. I, I don't, by the way, think that that's a reason why we should not have any gun control laws. Mm -hmm. um, we've had racist marriage laws in America. It doesn't mean we shouldn't have marriage laws. Uh, we've had racist property laws. No one would say we shouldn't have property laws because we had our history of racism, but it is something that ca should cause us, I think whenever we propose a gun control law, yeah. we should think twice about it. We should say to ourselves, are we perpetuating the same racial stereotypes we had perpetuated in the past in doing so? Why, why aren't there more black NRA members? I mean, there, this is lar this enthusiasm for guns within the NRA is largely a white working mm -hmm. class phenomenon. Why is that? Yeah. Um, I think in part um, we see a lot of support of, for gun control among African Americans. Um, 
that's not a con necessarily uniform or consistent approach. Uh, I think that uh, if you go back to the 50s and 60s, there were plenty of African Americans who thought they needed guns so that they could protect themselves against the racist police and uh, uh, and others of that ilk. Uh, and so they believed that there should be a, a right to have guns. But today we find in America that uh, it's racial minorities who are disproportionately represented in our urban cities, our urban areas, uh, and those urban areas are themselves disproportionately affected by gang violence, where mm -hmm. guns are being used uh, to commit harms and crimes regularly. Um, I think for a lot of people, especially you're a white guy out in Nebraska, it's hard to think why gov you think government is coming to get your guns because you're not seeing gun crime. They don't have the gangs that we have, mm -hmm. and they don't have these issues that uh, cities have. And so I think today you find a lot of African American support for gun control because uh, African American communities are among those communities that are disproportionately affected by gun violence. In some ways, it's a good sign for America yeah. that African Americans no longer feel they need to take up arms to fight white racists. In some strange way, that's a mark of progress. But if you're living in a high crime area, don't you need a gun to protect yourself? Well, you might, but I think a lot of the in these communities, I think there's a, a sensible realization that the gun control laws that you're talking about are really not going to stop anyone from having a gun to for, defend themselves. It just might make it difficult for the criminal to have guns. Last winter, after uh, 20 school children were shot and killed in Newtown, Connecticut, uh, it didn't seem like much of a stretch to suggest that this national debate, this this passionate fight over guns, had had reached a critical turning point. Uh, but then, we uh, on April 17th, the Senate failed to uh, pass a, a a very modest expansion of background checks. Mm -hmm. um, an idea that, according to polls, over 90 percent of Americans support. Uh, so where do you see this fight mm. to, uh, f th this battle over the right to bear arms, where, where do you see that battle going from here? Well, I think we're going to see a lot more activity at the state level. I think that the gun debate has been changed by Newtown, even if it didn't lead to new federal laws, because I think you're seeing new energy to the gun control movement. that can change the gun debate in some ways. I think that, you know, for 20 years or so, to the extent the gun issue has played a part in motivating people to vote, it's been exclusively on the gun rights side, mm -hmm. op opponents of gun control, basing their vote on that. And one of the reasons why the NRA has the power it has, or is perceived to have the political power it has, is because it can turn out the vote. Mm -hmm. And in a close race, or if you're fearing a primary challenger, that NRA endorsement really matters to these elected officials because it really matters with their voters. Um, if the gun control community can start to activate gun control supporters to be just as intense on guns, uh, to give money to candidates who support gun control, to refuse to give money to those who don't support it, to turn out to vote for a candidate because of their stance on gun control rather than their stance on 10 other issues. Um, if they can be active, active in this area with Michael Bloomberg's additional funding of ads and Gabriel Gifford's super PAC coming to play a role, it might change the gun debate in the long run. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you think they can? I think anything is possible. I do. I think um, uh, I, I never think that our situation today is the situation we'll have necessarily in the future. And uh, as some examples of that, I mean, think about tobacco. When I was a kid growing up in Los Angeles, everyone smoked everywhere. Uh, you couldn't avoid the smoke, no matter how you how how hard, how hard you tried. Uh, we're recording this on UCLA's campus, and uh, as of this month, uh, this campus is a smoke-free campus. You can't smoke indoors, outdoors, on campus, no smoking. You know, that's changed a lot. Uh, and back in the 1970s, we said tobacco was yesterday's NRA, right? They were no compromise. They never settled the case. They never gave in. They fought tooth and nail. But ultimately, the culture changed. Uh, and uh, I think the culture, part of what's going on with guns today is a culture war, uh, a war over that culture. Um, and gun rights advocates, I think, are more active in that because they recognize if they can normalize guns, make guns everywhere, make them normal, make them seem safe, they're more likely to win these debates in the future. Adam Winkler, thank you so much. Thank you for having me.